Welcome to Always Listening. We're your hosts. I'm Joel. And I am antitrust lawyer Jay. <laughs> we're gonna bust I'm up not. those we're gonna bust up those monopolies, Jay. <laughs> Union busting is what we were talking about last week, not not monopoly busting. Anyway, we, we are uh we are back to talk about all of the latest in podcasting news for you on this episode of Always Listening. You can find all of our episodes at always listening pod dot com uh jay uh we're, we're gonna jump right into it because you have quite a few things to talk about and i got a couple of topics in particular that i want to cover um the first one though i got a press release that i was really excited about i thought this was a service that you use i was confusing it with uh, another one clean feed which is one of the many available voip services out there for podcasters and uh people who are regularly conducting interviews online cleanfeed.net you can find them there their their blog and their newsletter came out the other day multitrack is here uh and it it um this was news to me although it's been in beta for a while and they talk about how to set this up you can even use it on their free accounts uh but this will allow you to record multiple tracks you and your guest or co-hosts uh all on separate tracks they say that drift and sync are no longer issues you'll be able to download the files individually and uh the only thing that you you would have to upgrade to for the pro features that i could see jay as i sort of perused it uh a little bit was um, higher quality audio. If you wanted to get up to like 256K or 320K per second, then uh, you needed to go to the pro account. The pro account is reasonable compared to other services like, you know, Ringer and things like that. Um, the downside to clean feed, as I can see it, compared to a service like Ringer particularly, is they don't have any mobile answer. Right now, you have to be on Chrome and you have to be on Chrome on a, a real you know, desktop, laptop, computer, tablets, and uh, phones are sort of out of the loop, which makes it much more limited. On that note, we don't have anything to announce yet, but I have been watching my email voraciously because the word is that this month sometime, Squadcast is going to roll out a mobile solution of some sort. I'm assuming that's an app. It's my understanding still that the mobile browsers, particularly, particularly on iOS, mobile Safari is not capable still of actually connecting to a VOIP solution. So I'm assuming they've got an app coming. But I mentioned online the other day on Twitter, I think, hey, Squadcast is great, I've heard, but they still don't have a mobile solution. And I got tagged and said, keep watching. It's coming in April. So um, I'm very excited to see that. The people I really respect that are using Squadcast on a regular uh, basis say that it is rock solid these days on the desktop and laptop side. And uh, if you could use that on an iPad and an iPhone, I think that is going to be my new solution. Clean feed is exciting. You mentioned, Jay, you've tried it before. It was just super techie. It was it was almost too much even for you to figure out and, and get going. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the most technically advanced uh, podcaster, but that exists out there. I, I, I probably know enough to be dangerous as they like to say in the biz. Um, and, and I used it and it was, and it's very nice and it, and it works great. The problem I had is with 32 different guys teaching all 32 of them how to use it was a chore because all of them came from different walks of life. Some of them very technically adept. Some of them were as adept as I was. And some of them have no technical adeptness whatsoever. So it's, um, it can be a little difficult and a little intimidating to use once you do get to know it and you and you figure it out. It is a fantastic tool. The fact that it now has multi-track makes it even better uh, for all of you audiophiles out there who like to have the uh, voice tracks on separate tracks so that you can edit out all the ums, ahs, clicks, all that stuff that I just gave to Joel to edit out. Hey, but you know, sometimes it's not even, and I'm going to leave all of that in, by the way, as a, as a, uh, <laughs> an example for our listeners, Jay, but sometimes it's not even about that. I was explaining this to a client the other day. One of the reasons why I love multi-track is because podcasters tend to record in bad environments. In particular, our guests often even don't connect with their real microphones, right? They, even if they have a microphone, maybe they don't understand how to connect it or get Skype to notice it, et cetera, et cetera. So you end up getting that laptop microphone or your uh, webcam microphone, which is going to capture effectively the whole room. If you're capturing multi-track, you can remove all of that room tone everywhere 
accept where the person is speaking. And so just the general noise floor of your audio can be much lower to begin with. So it's not even about the fancy yeah. editing. It's just about processing and saying, hey, I can cut out all of the silence that's not really silence and so limit my overall noise. Um, so that's the big thing that, that multitrack gains you. And it, it, there are services. Squadcast is a good one. Uh, uh, Ringer does it. Uh, I'm trying to think there's another Zencaster, although I've, I've heard Zencaster has some real drift issues lately. Uh, and then now Clean Feed as well as offering multi-track too. Zoom.us will even do multi-track recordings if you do if you set the settings up right. The problem is that Zoom, the audio is very, very low quality to begin with, Jay. So mm. I cannot, if you're anybody who's worried about trying to get higher quality audio, Zoom's not the way to go. Zoom is easy to use. I will say that. And a lot of, especially entrepreneurs, they really understand Zoom. They're using it for their their webinars and their meetings and things like that. And so uh, it's a service that they're already familiar with. That's the reason we're using Skype, right? Is because Skype is something that so many people are are familiar with already in their regular daily lives. And if you can make it easy for, especially if you have, you know, experts in your own field, but not in podcasting that are your guests regularly, you need to make it as easy as possible for those people. I don't remember who there's someone in one of our Facebook groups that's uh, getting ready to do a whole experiment, testing all of these uh, VoIP services so that they can provide examples of each service. You can make your own decision, which one you think sounds the best, works best for you, uh, all of that wonderful stuff. I personally use uberconference.com. It wasn't built for podcasting. It was built to record uh, business conferences, but it gives you the ability to uh, connect up to 10 people. Voice over internet also gives you an app option so that you can connect via a telephone uh, and give you that Skype quality sound and gives you an option for people who can't connect on an app or can't connect via computer to actually call in on a phone. So for like a guest who's not going to be a regular on your podcast who you know, maybe it's a big star, maybe it's an athlete, maybe it's a maybe it's an actor. Uh, they're not going to necessarily have all that stuff connected to their phone, or they're going to be traveling in between appearances. They want to call in on a phone. That gives them the ability to call in on a phone. It does only record in one channel, uh, so you don't get separate channels to mix out all that room noise that that you just mentioned. And obviously, if you're talking to someone while they're in a car, you're going to be able to hear that car noise in the background while you're speaking and you're not going to be able to take it out. But uh, knowing that, it is super easy to use. It is super free, which is also uh, a great four-letter F word that we all like to use in podcasting. Uh, and um, it's worked for me for four years. So uh, I that, that's what I use. I don't get paid by them either to talk about it, but um, I've used it for four years and I am not unhappy with it. I think the key, Jay, for your average podcaster is to understand, to get familiar with a bunch of these services, three or four at least. Find find two or three or three or four that work for you in different, uh, you know, case use case scenarios, and then. When someone contacts you and says, yeah, I'd love to be a guest on your show or I'd love to be your next uh, episode, except I have this problem. I can't connect via Skype. I only have FaceTime. Okay, well, how are you going to capture that FaceTime call? I, I, can, I can call in. Can I just call you? I'm not going to get on the internet, but I've got a phone. I can call you or you can call me. How are you going to record that? You know, you need to have an answer for that. And, and then you need to be able to scale it up and down. I mean, I've, and you're right. The more famous the guest, if you have a, a real celebrity on, there's no way you're going to get anything more than a cell phone call, probably. And it'll be a cell phone call. You'll have the 10 minutes in between one appointment and another, you know, or the 15 minutes in between one appointment and another while they're in the limo. You'll have their sort of half divided attention. You'll be lucky if they're not eating a sandwich. You know, <laughs> so so it's your job then if the audio is really bad with that. OK, take what they give you. Maybe you turn into an maybe that episode is a narrative episode, you know, and you you divide up the conversation and wrap it with narration where you sort of like hone in on the points that that celebrity brought you or whatever. Anyway, there's ways to do it and still keep your consistent audio quality while making it easy for the guest. That's the point. Make it easy for the guest. Make sure you can move on and and have a next episode of your show. Speaking of next episodes of shows, Jay, there are a lot of shows. Happy 700,000. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. There are seven. That's from Chartable. I listened to Todd Cochran on the new media show this past weekend. He says uh, the Blueberry uh, 
feed that he has that he provides of all of the existing podcasts up to 703,000. Uh, he gave an exact number on that particular show. Um, and then of course he made the joke that two thirds of them are dead. <laughs> Rob Greenley asked him, what does he mean by dead? And he said, they haven't updated in over a year. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're dead. You know, serial is a podcast that's existed for a number of years now. People are still going back and listening to serial for the first time. So, uh, depending on the type of podcast it is, it's dead or not. But that does lead to an issue when it comes to this. When you're looking at the discoverability problem, which I say there isn't a discovery problem. There's a discovery of you problem. Um, and that's Serial is a show that hasn't updated in a number of years. Won't probably update uh, ever again. It might, but I probably unlikely. And it's still relevant. There are other shows, though, that, I mean, maybe it's somebody who just tried out a service and they, they gave it a shot and they did their one free episode and they went, yeah, this isn't for me. This is a lot of work for, uh, for no return. I'm not going to do this anymore. That's a legitimate dead show. How does the industry police that? How do we take out the dead shows? Because it does gunk up the works. People are going to flood through, search for something and stumble across, you know, somebody's experiment. So the the first thing, Jay, I, I would say that we need to define dead, right? And I think you sort of said it there at the beginning. I think Todd's wrong to say that any show that hasn't released an episode, even if you go back, hey, this show hasn't released an episode in two years or five years, depending upon the content and the category of the show, that may not be a dead show. I would, I would, call a dead show one whose feed no longer works. If I can't actually mm -hmm. access the content, if I if the feed maybe lives in the directory, but in the, any individual episode is no longer accessible, or if the show notes don't work, et cetera, if I can no longer access that content properly, that's a dead feed. Those should be cleared out. And I think uh, Apple in particular generally does clean those uh, sh sorts of shows out. Now, if the content still exists on the internet, I think it's not a good place for us to be to make a value judgment about whether or not it should live forever, right? Like, that's not what I want to do. Right. I like the idea. If somebody's paying for it, whether that be the service or the podcaster themselves, if the content still exists and I can access it, I think we should call it a live feed. Here's what I would love to see is a move from all of the directories to – Anchor search in some way, like in the Apple podcast directory specifically, when you search for a podcast, the order in which those search results return is based on all time subscribers. So a show, uh, Corey Finneran, our friend with Ivy Envy, they've been doing a Chicago Cubs podcast for 10 years, but there was a podcast that started like five years before theirs, four or five years before theirs. It's been dead for almost you know, a decade now, but because that show had so many subscriptions in those first few years, for the longest time, Ivy Envy couldn't pop above it in search results. Uh, it just couldn't because it was, they had such a, a head start. So if you anchored it and said, hey, all time subscriptions matter, but subscriptions in the last six months matter more or downloads in the last six months matter more or something like that, mm. that would fix that. Um, the overcast directory who recently had a big update to their search results. And now I think if you're a podcaster in particular, Overcast is great just for the search because from anywhere in the app, from the directory, from, from the library, from wherever, you can go to the little search bar and type in anything basically and it will surface first of all shows but then episodes as well it's searching unlike the apple podcast directory it's searching the show title the episode title the show notes as well if they're you know regular text that that it can parse so it surfaces a lot for you but it surfaces some things instantly. It actually builds in this small cache of search results so that it can give you instant results. And the that cache is based on the current popular shows. So like it picks the the top, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 shows that are being downloaded. And I think it's even based on your own library. So 
the search results are not the same for you and me, but they are based on what the market is bearing and what's happening right now. And so that changes over time. Every time you're, not every time, but I think like once a week when it syncs with the server, those search results, those cached search results are updated. So this is an example of how Marco, and it's super smart, but it's also the kind of thing that's algorithmic so everybody could copy it. He's he's done a very simple tweak to his app, but what that's meant is when I go and I search for any phrase, if that phrase is is happening right now because everybody on Twitter is mentioning it because an NPR episode said it two weeks ago, that's going to surface immediately. That episode will pop up first as I'm searching for it because it knows that's very popular among the crowd that I follow on Twitter. So yes, I love that. That is a great first step. However, you can see where there's a second step problem that exists in that If it's sorting by the popularity of the shows, as more and more big corporations get involved, the audience is likely going to move more towards listening to the bigger shows. I will use myself as an example, as an NFL talk show host. I'm competing against ESPN. The guy who doesn't know me for Jack looks at this and goes, do I want to listen to ESPN or do I want to listen to Next Fan Up? Well, I don't know Next Fan Up. I know ESPN is a television property. I'm going to go listen to ESPN, even though I can say unbiasedly that my show is 10 times better than what ESPN is providing. Um, Perhaps using myself was a bad example, but that's sort of the point. The point is, is as more and more big corporations get involved in podcasting, that's where the fear from the independent podcasters lies is more and more big time broadcasters getting involved in podcasting, going to shove the independent to the side, if we're building search results that are ultimately going to favor the bigger podcaster, how do we find the discover? There will become a discoverability problem for the smaller podcaster. Yeah, sort of two separate issues there, I guess. The, the Yes, you're absolutely right. These sort of tweaks to the search directories or the directory search uh, engines would not fix the issue of the, the big corporations versus the little guys. Uh, it would fix, though, the the dead show idea or the ancient show idea mm. you know the um the fact of the matter is if hardcore his if dan carlin d- decides tomorrow that he's never going to produce an, another episode of hardcore history there is nothing wrong with the content that is out there and there won't be in five years or 10 years or in 50 years those shows will still be valuable so if you're a history podcaster and your complaint is, I can't get above Dan Carlin in the search results, and he hasn't released an episode in six months. I'm sorry, bud, but this, but the hundred that you've released in the last six months aren't as good as the one that he put out. You know, I mean, I, I say that. I shouldn't say aren't as good. They do not have the value in the market of what his one episode does, right? Like the, the, the right. inherent quality of any individual episode is, is subjective, obviously, but, but the, Anyway, there, there's something to that competing against the big corporations. And I think uh, th- we've talked about last week maybe the idea of eventually splintering these directories where you have the the pros and the independents kind of thing. And I would say that while there are positives to that idea and that potential future, the negatives to it are that people like Dan Carlin – probably wouldn't exist in that world. Dan Carlin was cast out by radio, started this thing right. on his own, and as an independent bubbled up to now be one of the tops of the market. Aaron Mankey certainly wouldn't exist in that world, right? Because lore wouldn't have been considered with the same weight of the NPRs and the Gimlet produced podcasts of the world when he was just doing it out of his his bedroom. Well, this makes a great transition to uh, PodTrack statistics. PodTrack recently just released uh, their chart of the uh, top podcast categories. Now, again, understand PodTrack does not track every podcast, but uh, they do have a fairly large sample size that they can delve into. Uh, and over the course of the le- of the year, February 2018 to February 2019, uh, there are two metrics, their average audience growth, Uh, based in a percentage, and the growth in number of shows, which was also expressed as a percentage. And uh, it's interesting to see how the categories uh, ranked out. So in terms of year-over-year average audience growth, the biggest category 
uh, was religion and spirituality. Now, their average unique monthly audience, according to the shows that PodTrack tracks, was only 147,000, um, give or take a couple 885 <laughs> other, other uniques. Um, but 93% year-over-year audience growth, tremendous audience growth. The number of uh, percentage of shows over that year was 58%. So you can see... Huge growth opportunity there in that particular category. TV and film, also with a smallish, unique monthly audience of only 254,000, uh, had 86% year-over-year average audience growth, uh, but had 68% year-over-year show growth. Uh, so more shows added to that particular category. Uh, and then the comedy category, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, in terms of unique monthly audience. I'm just double checking. And yes, it is the largest with 1.78 million uh, average unique monthly audience had 82% growth, 50% year over year percentage of show growth. Uh, very interesting. My category that I'm most interested had the least amount of year over year average audience growth, sports and rec with only 8%. However, 63% of new shows uh, added in that year. In other words, a whole bunch of new sports shows, no new listeners to those sports shows, which again goes to point out that like clog there, like people who know sports are going to go to the big name brands versus the little guy that's doing the sports show uh, out of his home. So here's the trend that I see. And if you look at this chart as a whole, Jay, here, here's what I take away from it. I see the areas where the audience bought into podcasting early because of their own lifestyles, right? Where they understood the technology and they were early adopters. I think sports is on the leading edge there because sports uh, fanatics have always been early adopters for anything. If you tell me I can buy a satellite and I can get more games, I'm going to buy a satellite, right? If you tell me I can order sports uh, satellite radio and I can listen to the games when I'm in the car, I'm going to order satellite radio even if I have to get a new radio for my vehicle, right? That's the sports fan. Technology fans right behind there too, I would guess. Technology enthusiasts uh, as well. So if you look, the growth in both of those areas, it was 8% for sports and rec and 11% in the audience for technology. That's because effectively everyone who's interested in tech, everyone who's interested in sports are already podcast listeners and have been probably for several years. What's happening there is the growth in shows. That's because now that audience is taking the next step and they're saying, hey, not only do I understand podcasts, I understand podcasting now. <laughs> I'm going to start my own show so that I can say I can speak to the specific niche of podcast uh, of sports that I'm missing. I'm listening to all these sports shows, but I'm not hearing what I want. I'll make that show myself. Same thing with tech. I'm, I l listen to a bunch of tech shows, but I'm not hearing the angle I want. I'll make that show myself. Um, same thing with comedy, right? You've got effectively every comedian in the, in the world already had a comedy show like they bought into podcasting a long time ago as a as a genre. Uh, and also I think that is the most naturally absorbable by the mainstream in the podcast format. If you think about like what we listen to in the car a lot, like the morning zoo radio type stuff where it's drop in and drop out. It's interesting conversation. It's humorous, but I don't really have to pay attention. I don't really have to follow it. I don't have to keep up episode to episode. I don't have to be knowledgeable in any industry or field to get it or enjoy it. That's the comedy podcast, basically, most of them. And so I think that's the reason why it sits there at the top. Um, but again, there's not a lot of growth opportunity in that industry. The thing that, that strikes me as religion and spirituality, I, I, uh, I did know that it was um, – it's one of the most popular as far as the number of total shows, I think – uh, the category. That category is super popular as far as people trying to fill out that market. But as you see, the actual listener base is pretty small. Well, that's based on pod track. I uh, wonder good, how that's many, a very good point. I wonder how many religion and spirituality shows are being tracked by pod track. I, I mean, mine isn't <laughs> very specifically. So, yeah, I'm using, yeah. I'm using blueberry stats. I'm not in pod track at all. Um, well, let's go to the other chart here. Cause, cause what's interesting here about that is business, uh, led, the categories in number of in percentage year over year percentage of show growth, business growth, number of new shows, 77%, but their average audience growth, only 37%. That is a saturated 
<laughs> that is the definition of saturation. If you have got 77% new shows and you only have 37% audience growth, you're saturated, just like sports. If you've got 63% new shows and you've only grown 8% audience, that is saturation. Stop making sports shows, Jay. Well, uh, and, <laughs> and probably stop making business shows. If you're talking generally about entrepreneurship or about uh, you know uh, money making or starting a small business, et cetera, et cetera, someone is probably covering that topic already uh, for you. Games and hobbies, similar. 75% uh, growth of new shows, only 80% growth of audience. But what's interesting there is only an average unique monthly audience of 95,000. For some reason, I still feel like that Something about those numbers don't add up. The math doesn't does not compute to me there. It, to me, that seems like there's an opportunity still. I wonder too. I think about a lot of uh, shows that are like live play podcasts where they play tabletop games of some sort mm. and and record that as a conversation. A lot of those I think end up falling into like the comedy category and and maybe they're even listed as such as opposed to games and hobbies. Although you might think about them in that category. So and the other thing is a lot of the independents, a lot of the smaller people that are doing that. You, like you said, with religion and spirituality, they might just not be tracked by pod track at all. Those are, those are sort of falling through the cracks of the industry. Right. And health was the third one. This one, this is a very good stat. If you're doing a health podcast, 71% new shows, 80% new audience. So, uh, very, that, that is the opposite of saturated. You, you can still build more health shows apparently. Well, and when you compare it to, you know, like comedy and society and culture and news and politics, which are all up over a million and a half, the health category only has 300,000. When you think about the vast majority of health blogs, when you think about all of the health channels on television that we have, the different shows and and uh, networks that are available, even just the websites that are doing like YouTube and things like that, it seems like there's obviously a lot of room for that category to grow in particular. If I was a yoga trainer, if I was a, um, a physical fitness trainer or something, I've got, as a matter of fact, I've got a couple of, um, uh, different people in the, in the, um, training, in the sports training, athletics training, uh, industry as clients, or I've had some, some over the years. Um, yeah, that would be, a place where I would be trying to figure out what is my angle on podcasting? What is an interesting audio product that I can offer? Now, speaking about being better, if I was a better podcaster slash researcher, I know that there was an article that was released oh, a number of months ago, I think probably even over a year ago. And I want to say it was from the folks over at Pacific Content, not 100% sure of the source that presented this very similar type research in terms of the different categories and number of shows in each of the categories and religion, as you had mentioned, was the top category with the most number of shows, the least underserved category in terms of number of shows was like shopping, uh, which I thought was interesting because I've always told my wife who is very much, she plays a game with our family. Guess how much I paid for this. Uh, and, and she is, uh, in like the top, like, 0.1% of savers at CVS markets. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the meme of the CVS uh, <laughs> receipts. Yeah, my wife uses every single one of those coupons that comes on those receipts. Uh, and she loves to play the game. Guess how much I paid for this? Basically, she'll go to the store and she has no problem showing you her Kohl's receipt that says, hey, I, I just saved... 75% on all of the merchandise I just purchased. Um, and then I'll be like, yeah, but you still spent that much money. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've always joked she should be creating this show, a shopping show, because it's an underserved category. And to me, I think as you are a person who's thinking about starting a podcast, you need to start thinking, especially now in this day and age, is more and more – Big name podcasters get involved, understand who your competition is, understand the niche that you're going to serve and understand if you are providing real value to that niche or are you just adding another voice to the noise? Because if it is just you're adding another voice to the noise and your ultimate goal is to, say, monetize your podcast, you're not going to succeed. You're going to come up way short. But if you are adding value and you are and and you and you are providing something of service to your niche, you're going to do very well. 
Conversely, if you are just adding another voice to the noise and you don't care about monetizing your show, then none of – why are you listening to this particular podcast? <laughs> well, but I mean like the, the point though is to know what your why is, right, Jay? And then to orient everything that you do with your podcast, the amount of money you spend on a podcast host the amount of money you spend on a website or not the you know how you orient your uh calls to action what what those calls to action are all of that depends on why are you doing the show do you just want to start a podcast period do you have a passion that you want to podcast about uh are you looking to grow your business or to grow your brand or are you looking to fill a niche or solve a problem you know so what what is that why and then once you answer that all of these other things will fall into place uh but i do think there are some opportunities out there if you're listening and you're like boy i really like podcasts and and i have a salon you know, I think there is an opportunity for you. If you have a retail space, I think there's an opportunity for you. If you are a local chamber of commerce, I think there's an opportunity for you to get into that shopping vein somewhere and figure out how can I do this in audio that's interesting and compelling and interesting to me and will provide value for the audience out there. And I can help you do that too. Facebook.com slash Podvader page. I'm more than happy to talk to you about that particular opportunity and how I can help you create that opportunity. One of, one of the things you would definitely tell them not to do, Jay, is to put their podcast behind a paywall, right? Mm -hmm. This is one of those – we, we talk all the time off the air about things that I should perhaps watch my tongue about, Joel. Uh, and this perhaps is one of them. But – there is data, and it's not 100% apples to apples, that's being released by Jacobs Media. Every year they do uh, a tech survey. Now, their survey is of radio station listeners. That is their audience. That's whom they're polling. That is the pool of opinion that they're pulling this from. So again, remember, this, this is not apples to apples. This isn't like what Edison Research does. Edison Research does a random poll and and they'll explain exactly how they pull their audience and what they get their opinion pool from jacobs media does theirs a little differently they actually interview radio listeners so these are people that are identify as radio listeners and in their tech survey that they've done for a number of years now their most recent data they asked um would you be willing to register, providing your name, email address, zip code, in order to listen to your home station's audio stream? Now, back in 2016, 71% of their audience said yes, they'd be more than willing to. But that has fallen precipitously since 2016 to now only 60% say yes, they would do that. And you have to assume, based on the statistics, that 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 is one of those graphs that will continue to trend downward. So if you're considering putting your content behind a paywall, understand that less and less people are more likely to sign up for your paywall be, for a number of reasons. The, the tech survey will go further into that. I do not believe that their new survey is public yet. I know that they have done a couple of presentations at some of the radio conferences that have been going on. I believe they've presented at Radio Days Europe, which is going on right now. Uh, I believe they also presented at a RAIN conference that occurred not too long ago in the past week or so. Uh, they usually do make this a public uh, – they do usually release this information publicly. Uh, Follow them, jacobsmedia.com. You can sign up for their newsletters and they'll announce when they do release it. But it is something to take note of from all of those companies that want to be the Netflix of podcasting, for instance. The more and more you're putting your stuff behind a paywall, the least likely an audience is to sign up for it. Well, and even even before you pay, Jay, just the simple idea of, of capturing an account uh, you know, of creating an account and tracking the data. Uh, that's, that's one of the things here is just like, literally, would you sign in and give them your email address and a zip code, your name? Um, and, uh, that, that response has, has dropped off those, those 11 points and more in just a year and a half or two years. The interesting analogy to me is the big corporation. So most of us have either an Apple music account or, or a Spotify account, or a Pandora account, even if we're free users of one of those services. 
you have to log into that. You have an email address attached to it, or you give them your Facebook account. In the case of Spotify, you can do it that way too. But if you give them your Facebook account, they're tracking you even more than if they had your email and your zip code, right? Mm -hmm. I do think though, if you compare it to podcast apps outside of Apple, none of the podcast apps that I'm aware of even the ones where you create an account, none of them advertise to you in any way, do they? Like I don't Castro never sends me I have a Castro account, but Castro never sends me an email at uh, an email saying, "Hey, come check out this new feature or or come check out this podcast that's available in our directory." I know for a fact Overcast never does. Overcast posts things on Twitter when they have new features and things like that, but they don't market to their users in in any way. Spotify does. Spotify does. You're absolutely right. Apple Radio does. absolutely does. iHeart does. Hmm. Interesting. I don't. I don't have an iHeart account. I don't guess. So I don't get. I don't get uh, advertised to from them. But uh, like a Stitcher does. Now that I think about it, don't they? Stitcher does that as well. They promote things in their in their marketplace. So I, I guess it's not completely out of the realm of possibility in the podcast world either. It's just well, an this interesting gets into thing. the. Well, it gets into the BBC versus Google thing, right? So the BBC doesn't want their content on Google. Why? Well, all of that valuable data, because all of that data, that that you data that we just mentioned, where you're located and all that stuff, is valuable to an advertiser. And if they can sell your advertising without having to pay a third party, Google, BBC, does not have to pay Google for that third party information, then they make more profit from the advertising than the third party. And of course, the third parties want all of that information so that they can make money off of that information with their advertising. And that's sort of where the BBC versus Google is starting to, it's starting to formulate a little bit more. It was a little murky as to why they were doing this. Now it's starting to become a little bit clearer and it's all becoming clearer due to dollars and cents. It's all about Who's going to control who's making the money and who's going to make the money off of whose product? And ultimately, the BBC is like, we need to make the most money off of our product versus somebody else making the money off of our product and and not giving up a portion of that money to that particular party. And that's where a lot of this is going to. Uh, I was I was listening to a conversation on the No Agenda podcast with the podfather, Adam Curry and John C. Dvorak, talking about all the over the top. Uh, things that are coming out on the video side, you know, it's Netflix versus uh, Disney versus, you know, CBS versus NBC. Everybody's got to have their own over the top platform. Well, the reason why is because they can make more money on their own property versus having it on the Netflix property. Now there's still in, in that regard, there's still valuable content such as friends, a show that, hasn't been on the air for over 25 years where they're still going to maybe even make more licensing that content to Netflix versus keeping it in house on their own over the top platform and then selling advertising on that. But eventually all of that money is going to dry up. Like Netflix is going, Netflix is still not making any money. They are not a profitable company at this particular point in time. They, they still are operating in the red and that's something that will eventually catch up. I don't care if there is a phrase too big to fail. No, eventually the, the, eventually the bank is going to come knocking on the door and say, Hey, we need our money. And you're going to say, I can't pay. And the bank is going to say, well, then you're done. Um, all of that will eventually catch up. It's just a matter of when, how I doubt it's going to happen tomorrow. I doubt it's even going to happen within the next decade, but it is something to keep an eye on and understand that's what's really happening behind the scenes. It's not a, the BBC thinks that they're too good to be everywhere else. No, the BBC knows that they have valuable content that they can make the most money from providing that content on their own platform. Controlling it entirely. The, the interesting thing will be to see how it settles out. And if we end up, I think what, what's going to end up happening is we're going to have a few aggregators. It, it will effectively, this is definitely already happening with video, right, Jay, where they're effectively replacing the cable model, but with streaming services now where you buy these packages. And yeah, I have Amazon Prime and for a few bucks extra, I get Showtime and HBO. And also we bought Hulu and with the Hulu add on, I get, you know, my sports package or whatever. And the total, how much do you pay for it total? Uh, about $120 a month with the internet, which is the same thing that I paid for cable. You know, like that's, 
like that's the way that it's going to work. It, it's already shaking out. And I think that I think it's very possible that the audio world could end up being very similar where we all have to have the Spotify app and we all have to have the Apple podcast apps and we all have to have maybe the BBC app because, or maybe the ESPN app, for instance, maybe they start bringing some of their stuff exclusively into their own uh, silos so that um, we have to have those for the specific content. And then we still have that overcast app or pocket casts or whatever, that third party app for all the independent stuff that we like. I think that is entirely possible five years from now. Well, and as I mentioned in the last show, this would be good news for the independent podcaster. If the bigger guys are going to take their ball and go home, Apple's got to promote something. They, they, they're going to still have an interest in promoting something. Spotify is still going to have an interest in promoting something unless they buy it, uh, such as Parcast or, or Gimlet or, or what have you. Uh, so they're still going to have to promote something, and that's going to be you uh, if you're providing good quality content that is promotable. Uh, that's the other thing. Understand what great content really is, not what good content is. Great versus good, there is a there is a giant difference in that definition, um, which I'm gladly – I will gladly share with you <laughs> Pod Vader page on Facebook. Uh, Jay, I want to talk very quickly about the Spotify podcasters dashboard. So uh, matter of fact, I'm going to open up my browser here and go to it so that I know I'm telling you the right place. Um, but if you go to podcasters.spotify.com, you have to have a Spotify account. So if you've ever used Spotify as a user, you can log in with the same credentials that you use to log in and listen to Spotify. Uh, but once you've logged into that, the idea is that this is where you can submit your show. If you have a podcast and you're not on Spotify yet, you can paste your RSS feed in there directly and submit your show to Spotify and get it on their directory. I wondered... What about a show that's already in the Spotify directory, but that I don't have access to their statistics through this dashboard? How might I claim a show? Is that possible? Uh, the reason that I was interested in this was because I used, I started using the dashboard for my new show, Backsliding to Glory. It, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned last week, I'm hosting that show on Squarespace directly using the Blueberry stats, but that meant that I didn't have like a direct connection through Libsyn or Blueberry or something to submit the show to Spotify. So I needed to go to this dashboard and submit the show. I did that. And then afterwards, I'm like, hey, it's really cool. I can see my statistics for each episode and how many people are starting it and how many people are listening to it and how many followers I have, which is a statistic that we don't really get from Apple, for instance. I was like, I would like this for my other shows too. How can I do that? It's actually really easy. If you take your RSS feed for a show that's already in the Spotify dashboard, you paste it in and go through the whole process of claiming it. The first thing you have to do is it verifies that the RSS feed works. Uh, it asks you, it's going to send a verification code to the email address that's in the feed. And then you have to paste that code back into Spotify's dashboard to claim the show, prove that you own it. But once you do that, you get to the very end and there's a submit button down at the bottom right. At the top uh, right, there is an X button. If instead of hitting submit, you hit the X and then go back to your catalog of shows, that new show should, when you refresh the page, it should show up there in your list of shows and boom, you've got it in your dashboard. I now have all of my podcasts listed. I can see all of them in the Spotify dashboard, even though three of them were submitted directly to Spotify through Spreaker. Um, it's really, really cool. And for any podcasters who have wanted access to this info from Spotify, there's your path to do that. The one caveat that I will say is that I had a friend, uh, Ravi. Um, I can't remember Ravi's last name now, but he posted on Facebook. He said he followed my instructions and it didn't work for him. So there's your caveat. Maybe it doesn't work for everybody. I'm not sure what he didn't do or did do, or maybe it's something with his browser, et cetera, et cetera. But for me and for several others who have followed these instructions, they ha now have access to their show. Why might you want it? One, today you can see uh, within 24 hours, you can see the statistics for your shows in Spotify's stats, which is kind of cool. One imagines, though, as they integrate in the future, Spotify and uh, the technology from Anchor, there might be new features that they only offer through their dashboard and don't send out to an API to 
host partners like Spreaker and Libsyn, et cetera, et cetera. And so this would be a way for you to get access to those, even if you're hosting with another media company. Um, Anyway, it's something that I would want to do if, uh, well, it's something I did want to do. So I did it for my shows. I wanted to share that with people too. Interesting little feature there. I am still not on Spotify until I get the word that it is a pass-through option so that my dynamic ads will be delivered via Spotify. For me, building my audience on Spotify does me no financial good unless I can monetize it. And uh, at this particular point in time, as far as I know, I still cannot. I believe that is something that is being changed, but I haven't seen any official word or announcement yet. So until I do, I am still not on Spotify, although I'm dying to jump at the chance because there's clearly an audience growing on Spotify and I would love my show to be part of it. Well, I will say I have seen, um, I've seen some good pickup there for my uh, religious show in particular for backsliding to glory. It seems like a lot of people uh, enjoy listening to it. There, always listening is fairly popular. It's more popular on Spotify than it is on Stitcher, for instance. So, uh, that for what that's surprise me. Yeah. Stitcher, Stitcher seem, doesn't seem like a place people go to anymore. I think there's a large segment of the market that that's the only version of podcasting they know and they don't want to go outside of it for whatever reason. And Spotify, and I will say Stitcher has evolved over time to make that um, more tenable. You know, it, it, it doesn't shake off listeners like it did once upon a time, I think. And um, mm. well, I mean, I know anecdotally the people that I know that listen to Stitcher, they say, I love it. It works fine for me. Why would I switch? What, and, and when I tell them about features of other podcasting apps, they're just, those don't interest them. They're like, no, I get everything that I want right here. It continues to serve my needs. Uh, and you know, they had a big upgrade in audio quality a couple of years ago after Midroll took over. So, right. you know, like why why not stick with them? Stitcher's a great listening listening app. I just feel like right now that they're marketing a lot more of their paywall, which mm-hmm. might be turning off new listeners who don't want to listen to paid information but don't understand there's plenty of free content available on the stitcher app pretty much everything that you listen to on any of the apps is available on stitcher yeah i mean you do have to submit to it separately just like iHeartRadio or something but uh it is a a public you know podcasting app anybody can be on there uh date for your diary here it's in the show notes too if you want to get registered for this but the edison research we mentioned him earlier uh, the podcast consumer uh, new webinar is going to be out on Thursday, April 11th. So we'll have another episode between here and there, but you've got a week or so to register for this. Uh, and you can click the link in our show notes. If you want to watch this live, uh, we're going to be doing that Jay, obviously. And, and then we'll, uh, we'll discuss it here on the show. Of course. Of course. And I get to watch my good buddy, Tom Webster again. It's fantastic. Let's get to currently listening. What are we currently listening to? <laughs> I'm going to go first, Jay. So this week I listened to one of my competitors. You know, we talk about, I talk about sometimes podcast be podcasting being a, uh, you know, a market of abundance. It's not a place where we're, where we're really competing against one another. We're, we're competing with the world that doesn't know about podcasting yet. One of those quote unquote competitors, one of my colleagues, Carrie Caulfield, Eric, she's a podcast editor and consultant herself. She's got a company called Yaya podcasting. Uh, she does a show called just podcasting and she dumped a, a whole season basically at once Netflix style recently. And I had not gotten to listen to any of them. I finally started going through them. I specifically listened to an episode with our friend, Jenny Wren Stratup, uh, from gritty birds, uh, uh, podcast and, uh, Steve Stewart, who is another podcast editor as well. And, and the, um, uh, admin, the founder of the podcast editors club on Facebook, um, which is huge. It's almost 4,000 members now. Anyway, it's a great show. She talks about, she talks with podcasters, specifically people who are in this industry and who've been at it for a while. She talks to them about what their lives were like before podcasting and, and how podcasting has affected their life and their relationships and their outlook on life and things like that. Very, very interesting if you're in this space and you love um, hearing about others who are doing it. If, you, if you're the kind of person who has ever gone to a podcast conference and come back and been like, oh, man, I finally got to talk about all this stuff that I don't get to talk about with my friends normally, this is a good example of a show where you can get that kind of conversation on a regular basis. Uh, it's called Just Podcasting and all the podcast apps, and there's a link for it in the show notes as well. Joel, I'm a big fan of the fictional podcasts. I've been, I've long been a believer that fictional podcasts is the wave of the podcasting future, as 
people, as it becomes easier and easier for people to listen to podcasts in the car, they're going to look for stories and fictional podcasts or audio dramas, however you want to refer to them, is going to be the thing that people are going to be looking for. Like talking about last night's show is great. You know, talking about what happened in the world of sports is great. Talking about what's happening in the world of podcasting is a, is a phenomenal niche, but telling an original story that in, you know, gives somebody the theater of the mind uh, is something altogether different. It's something that I dabbled with a little bit in college. Uh, it's something that I have great respect for, for people that do it. And there's this new show uh, that stars an Academy Award winner, uh, Joel uh, Rami Malek. It's called Blackout, and it's being done uh, in uh, with Endeavor Audio. And the reason I started listening to this is because in one of the many newsletters, and I'm sorry I can't give the credit to where I saw this, I desperately searched for where I saw this. This is why I need to update our show notes on a daily basis, Joel, <laughs> and not like an hour before we do the show. Um, their headline was blackout is great, but these ads are killing me. <laughs> so I went, Hmm. And, and they, and they mentioned in the, in the write up of the show that, uh, it is a podcast about a radio broadcaster. So there was a little bit of irony involved in saying that, uh, blackout is great, but these ads are killing me. Well, listen to the show. Here's one of the problems that, that you have as an audio fiction person, if you have too many characters and you don't have a based narrator to sort of direct you to whom these voices are, you tend to lose who that character is. And if it's an original piece of work, you're not necessarily um, – you're not all in yet on that particular character. So somebody could be saying something you're like, wait, who's that? Wait, who's that? And, and the listener is left trying to guess with – who's actually talking unless you recognize Rami Malek's voice. And then obviously you're all in on that particular character and he is the main character. So you should be, but a lot of the secondary characters around him, there's too many of them and you can't really follow because nobody's referring to them by their name before that person speaks. Like you need to have some sort of identifier to that particular person. There are creative ways to do it. This particular podcast does not do that. They, they just go full in on telling you a story. The ads do come in sort of out of nowhere. One of the problems I think too, with this particular one is the background has sort of the best way I would describe it as a, a murky sound in the background because it is sort of a thriller type. There, there's this major blackout and nobody knows what, what is actually going on. Is this, you know, is, is there, is there some sort of attack? Like a fighter jet just crashed into the near side, you know, a mountain nearby, you know, what is going on? There's this major blackout for miles and miles and miles. It's based in New Hampshire. People are going to the Canadian border and they're being turned back. What, what is happening? Um, so, so the background music is is eerie and murky, and it does the transition into the ads is tough. They decided to go with the theme <laughs> with the theme music that's sort of happy and peppy, and it's meant to be that way sarcastically if you hear the lyrics to the song. But when it's just the music and it's the ad, it's really off base. The creator is the one that's voicing the these ho these host red ads. So it's really awkward. I bring all this up because there is a fiction podcast that I've worked with before that does the ads right. It's called The Wicked Library. Now, unfortunately, in their latest episode, <laughs> they did not do what I'm about to describe. But uh, they had an ad deal uh, with, a, uh, with one of the wine companies, uh, like the Wine of the Month Club. Uh, and I don't remember the name of the company. But they created a very special like mini sode inside the episode so that it was its own fictional story around the ad. Now that's going above and beyond what the advertiser was looking for, but it's the exact right way. If you're doing audio fiction to incorporate the ads into the story. I know that there's, um, there's another podcast, very popular one. Uh, it's got the little car on it. Uh, you gotta help me out here, Joel. You talking about Alice isn't dead? Yes, thank you. <laughs> it may maybe it's not that one, but there is one where there is a radio broadcaster, and they 
and the way that they go to their ads is you actually hear the radio broadcast switch to the advertisements and the advertisements are coming in through the radio. So there, are, like I said, there are creative ways if you're doing a fictional podcast to incorporate the ads into your show without it being sort of jarring and, and feel completely out of place. And obviously you want to make those ads at transition points in the story so that you make that transition. But then again, you have to have a narrator come in and sort of, explain where you've jumped from. If you're no longer with the main character and now you're with the main character's son who's off in the woods, you need to have a way to tell the audience that's where you've gone because it, otherwise like their mind hasn't traveled there. Yeah, this is, I, I feel like this, these are some of the same sorts of growing pains that we've talked about before. It's just a reminder of how young our industry is. TV did the same thing. Radio did the same thing, right? When, when uh, TV first started, People didn't understand the medium and what it was. And so even the shows, but definitely the advertisements, were just copies of what they were doing on radio. They would literally take a radio program, stage it, put a camera in front of it, and that was the TV show. And the same thing for their commercials, right? They did the commercials the same way that they had on radio, which was effectively like host read. Uh, you know, it's the Lucky Strikes cigarette hour, and I'm here to tell you Lucky Strikes is a healthy brand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Eventually, they realized that, oh, wait, this is a visual medium. We have different forms of storytelling that we can do here that aren't possible on radio, so we'll adapt to this new medium. And eventually, they took those same lessons to the advertisements as well, and they said, hey, we'll make effectively um, native content, right? Native advertising. You eventually made a commercial for TV that was like a little TV show. And now every commercial is like a little TV show. They have a story. They have an intro and an outro. They have a, you know, a punchline, the whole, and there are some that are different genres, like the whole nine yards. I think we'll get there with podcasting as well. It's just, again, it's a reminder of how early we are, which is why like the, the, the post earlier where you had, um, you know, congratulations on 700,000 shows, that tweet says, there's never been a better time to start a podcast. Like, and that's absolutely true. Like, we're still in the infancy of this medium. It seems like we're oversaturated. We were talking earlier about, you know, areas or categories that are oversaturated. That's only because of our current audience size. Over time, everyone will be a podcast listener <laughs> in some way, right? And and so as our medium grows, there will be room for all these other things. But if you're interested in it, if you are at all involved in thinking, hey, this is an area that I would like to tackle, now's the time to jump in and take chances. Do that thing that you think, well, I haven't heard anybody try this before, but I feel like it'll work. If it will, everyone might be copying you in two or three years. You might be, you know, the the woman that we're talking about as like the historical fulcrum point on which the industry <laughs> turned, you know? Yes. Uh, I, will, I will give a couple more of these uh, fictional audio shows a shot because there's more and more of them coming into the, uh, into the realm. But again, it, it ha the, the story has to be told in a way that you have a narrator. I remember – my basically my 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 final thesis when I went to Emerson College was a radio play. I readapted uh, Frank Miller's Sin City, a Dame to Kill for, and I had a ginormous cast. If you've read that comic book, you know that there's quite a number of characters, and I basically had the character of Dwight be the narrator of the show, just like in the comic book. Has the comic book has basically a narrator in the boxes, and then dialogue is in the bubbles. Well, I'd made Dwight read the boxes and Dwight's voice was, you know, I put a little bit of a reverb effect on it. So it sounded like you're listening to Dwight's thoughts as the narrator to help direct my audience through. And of course I got an A plus on that job, uh, you know, not to pat myself on the back, but you know, I, that's the way I operate. I wish we had better copyright laws so that we could listen to that in some way in a, in a, oh, in a derivative format. I so used licensed. I, I used licensed music and everything. It was. No, I know. That's what I'm saying. Which you could, it's the kind of thing you could do in an educational setting, but because of the uh, the copyright laws, we can't share that in any way. That's why. Oh I'm God! About. 
And trust me, if I could license all of that Metallica, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, <laughs> oh, I used, I, I mean, I used the biggest, heaviest hitters. <laughs> so it's a very really, 90s soundtrack you're telling me. Oh, like it. well, it's a 90s comic book. <laughs> I'm telling you right. First of all, it. First of all, it's on a reel-to-reel tape. So, unfortunately, unless <laughs> you, don't you have, know, don't even know how to transfer unless, it currently, unless you have a multi-track reel-to-reel machine somewhere, uh, there's no way to actually listen to this thing anymore. Um, but I do still have it, and I actually still have all the parts because I only finished chapter one out of six chapters. So, uh, chapter one is finished. There's five more chapters that I would love to finish at some point with licensed music <laughs> for my own personal we, uh, listening pleasure. We figured out what the Patreon is for, Jay. <laughs> the Patreon <laughs> is if you if you sign up for the Patreon, you get to come to a listening party. We're gonna hook up some uh, reel to reel tape, and we'll we'll listen to the first chapter of uh, A Dame to Kill for, as produced in audio drama by by Jay Soderberg, a young Jay Soderberg. That's right. Um, hey, uh, tell everybody where they can find you online, Jay. I am at the real pod Vader on Twitter. Next fan up at gmail.com is a great way to email me and, uh, facebook.com slash pod Vader page. If you are interested in, uh, you know, me working with you to help you with your podcasting needs. Likewise, you can check me and all of my stuff out at propodcastingservices.com. I'm on Twitter at the rogues life. Uh, and until next time we've been your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Jay, not an antitrust attorney. <laughs> and we are always listening. Yeah, I know I ain't seen it all, but I've seen enough. Yeah, I know I ain't seen it all, but I've seen enough. Always Listening is a proud member of the Two Guys and a Rogue Network. You can find all our reviews by searching Always Listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, or anytime at alwayslisteningpod.com or email us at alwayslisteningpod at gmail.com. Our theme song is Enough by Bethany Raber. Two guys and a rogue. I'm one guy. I'm the other. And this is The Network.